Welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, and today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to explore dogs who are detecting COVID-19. And there's something silly in penguin poop? Let's go. Hi, everyone. What an exciting week. Bewilder Beasts has been getting some traction, and we're now getting more listeners. So welcome everyone who's just joining us for the first time. I'm still recording from my closet. Today I'm stuck between my wedding dress and a hoodie I haven't seen since the mid-90s. This podcast started when I was teaching kids this summer due to COVID-19 with virtual lessons about cool animals and fun facts. So today I thought we'd actually cross that threshold. We are going to do a deep dive on an animal who is working really hard to help humans stop COVID-19 in its tracks. But first... Penguins are so cool, but you know what's even cooler? Their poop. First, we're going to talk about Adelie penguins and their poop, which is a unique pink color, thanks to all the krill that they eat. And there's so much of this poop that you can see it from space. And that's a good thing since these penguins are really hard to see, but their poop, it sticks right out because it stains everything. As much as your parents probably think that that's gross, that's not the only penguin poop fact I have for you today. In addition to seeing penguin scat from space, researchers have some problems with some other penguin poo. The king penguin's poop has so much nitrous oxide in it, researchers found themselves in a bit of a bind. You see, nitrous oxide is commonly known as laughing gas. It's the same stuff your dentist might use to relax a patient before a shot of Novocaine. It also happens to be significantly more damaging to the environment than carbon dioxide, which is no laughing matter. I'm wondering how many of those researchers thought when they were kids, hmm, I can't wait to grow up. I want to save the environment and get loopy on penguin poop. Finally, let's get back to those dogs who might help us get out of quarantine. You ready? So as we discussed in an earlier episode, dogs have been trained to find whale poop, which they could detect over a mile away over water with just their noses. And we know that they are capable of sniffing out all sorts of things. Explosive, drugs, narcotics, missing people, and so much more. So how good is a dog's sense of smell? Well, when I teach classes like scent work, teaching dogs to find anything for fun in your house, I always tell my students that their dog's noses are essentially x-ray vision. They can sniff through walls and up to 40 feet under your feet. That's four basketball nets standing on top of each other underground. We have dogs who can detect cancer in human spit, sweat, or urine with over 90% accuracy. We have yet to come up with a machine that is more accurate than a dog's nose. There are dogs who help people with diabetes detect drops in blood sugar to keep them safe. There are dogs who are trained to alert their owners to move away from stairwells and dangerous areas before having a seizure. And there are even dogs who detect malaria just by sniffing socks worn by people with the disease. So it was just a matter of time before we tried to see if we could train dogs to find COVID-19. If we could train them, they could do big sweeps in airports or find people who may be asymptomatic. These are people who are sick but might not know it yet because they don't have symptoms. They might be able to help us out in our schools or other large areas spot infected people before the spread gets out of control. Again, or still, depending on how you look at it or where you are located. So how do we train them to find COVID-19? That's a bit of a misnomer. When researchers are training is a new odor that people with the virus make, not the virus itself. It's like, if I asked you how cookies smell before they're cooked versus when they're in the oven, Uncooked, cookie dough has a smell for sure, but as soon as you cook it, the chemical reactions change the potency of the dough. And in the same way, our bodies change the way the virus smells, or rather, COVID-19 changes the way we smell by releasing volatile organic compounds. This is a distinct odor of cells dying as a cause of a virus, and which smells differently depending on which disease causes these volatile organic compounds. Cancer, diabetes, tuberculosis, and COVID-19 all have different volatile organic compounds and they smell distinctly different to a dog. 
The very first thing researchers do is collect samples from people. Spit, sweat, or pee, and test it for COVID-19. If there are positive tests, those viruses in the sweat, spit, or pee are rendered inactive, meaning they kill the virus. And they put it in a special container that dogs can smell through. And then dogs are trained with positive reinforcement to let dogs know that they got the right odor. If a dog smells a container with COVID-19, they are given a treat or a ball. Over time, they only get a reward, the treat or a ball, if they can successfully pick out the virus. Which according to one study from BMC and Springer Nature, of 1,012 samples, the eight dogs who were trained for only one week were able to detect COVID-19 with 94% accuracy. I didn't even do that on my driver's test. And if all goes well, each dog can scan over 250 people in one hour, which is remarkably fast. So if they can do this, why aren't we just releasing the hounds? Well, it takes six months to truly train these dogs to be accurate with the containers, but also in the field. Sniffing people in a hurry to their gate is way different than sniffing containers in a quieter laboratory setting. If the dogs are deployed to a school or sports stadium for a game to sniff moving targets with snacks, how many of those dogs are going to forego their COVID training when a kid's fruit roll-up or a shirtless stadium fan's hot dog shows up? My dog captain would 100% ignore all of his training for the chance at some floor snacks left behind by literally anyone. The next phase for some of these dogs in Pennsylvania in the United States is to see if dogs can just pick up the scent of COVID-19 on infected people's clothing. Like the study I mentioned earlier with kids who sent socks in and were snout scanned for malaria. In the malaria study, the dogs had what the researchers thought were false positives, but it turns out the dogs were actually just ahead of the game. Some of those socks were worn by kids who didn't test positive for malaria with standard testing, but did get picked up by the dog's super sniffer. When they were tested again, those same kids tested positive for malaria. It's also important to mention that releasing the hounds might not be appreciated by everyone. Not all kids love dogs. So this can be really scary for kids who might not have been exposed to a lot of friendly dogs or kids and adults from cultures where maybe dogs are not common household pets. In fact, dogs are pests in many parts of the world. Over 85% of the world's billion dogs are unowned and they don't live in houses. They live on streets or in dumps foraging for food. Many dogs who were owned live outside with sheep or live outside all winter pulling dog sleds. These dogs might never live inside of a house. And that might look very different, very different from the dogs in our city of Boston who wear sweaters when it's chilly and get only the best organic food served at exactly 6 p.m. so they can get a head start on their pre-bedtime nap. Some people have had bad experiences with dogs too so they might not be comfortable with a dog giving them a full body sniff, even if it is for their health and for science. All of that is to say people have different ideas about what dogs are and where their place is in society, and it's better to be mindful of that too. While I think a dog's place is in the home, usually on a couch, and often under my covers as I live in a cold state, not everyone shares my affinity for dogs. And that doesn't make people wrong. It means we should take other people's relationships with animals under consideration when deploying the medical mutts. The most common question I get as a dog trainer is how to protect our dogs from COVID-19, especially in light of a dog named Buddy who was reported to have died from COVID, which understandably scared a lot of pet owners. But it turns out the dog who died had cancer. So it's unknown if the death was from cancer or from COVID or if it was a combination of both. The CDC has information on what to do if your pet does contract COVID, but according to the CDC, no pets have died directly from COVID-19, while a few have contracted it, and of those few who did contract it, they only had very mild symptoms. So wait, you're telling me my dog can get COVID-19? Well, yes and no. While more than 4 million people have been diagnosed with COVID-19 in the United States, fewer than 25 pets have. You see, if you are careful in not exposing your dog to the virus, just like we humans should be doing if we can, your pet should be totally fine. If you do get COVID and you're worried about your pet, I would be, you can just do your best to separate your pets from you if you can by having an action plan in place. 
If it's an unavoidable circumstance, the data is fortunately on your side, as I mentioned. Fewer than 25 pets have been tested positive for COVID as of the end of July 2020. That number is absolutely higher now, as we're now in September, but I couldn't find any updated data. But it's important to talk about how this disease spreads. COVID-19, like other coronaviruses, are zoonotic, meaning it can be passed between some animals and humans, and back to some animals from humans, like a two-way street. Not every virus, parasite, or disease is zoonotic or even contagious between dogs and people. Let's take ringworm. It's a fungus that if you touch it, or a surface that it has been on, or lay in a bed that an infected animal has touched in recent history, the site where you touched becomes itchy and forms a ring. That's zoonotic and highly contagious and treatable between humans and dogs, and cats, and goats, and sheep, and horses, and cows, and mites, and rats. You get the idea. But let's look at canine influenza. That's not something humans can catch from their dogs, but this coronavirus? It appears that in the case reporting, the animals are getting it from us, humans. Either asymptomatic carriers working in mink farms or zookeepers infecting the animal population, generally to large cats like tigers, which have gotten most of the press so far, or from people who have been sick with COVID-19 and their pets got the disease. So the best thing you can do? All the things we should be doing anyway. Wear your masks, stay six feet apart from people, and wash your hands often. Keep your pet's exposure low too. And no matter what, don't get within six feet of tigers, unless you're a trained professional. What animal doesn't have a father, but has a grandfather? A drone bee. You see, queen bees can mate with drones to create worker bees and other queen bees, but they never make drone bees. Drone bees are from unfertilized eggs, so they have a mama, the queen bee, but no father. These drones share her DNA. The queen, however, she did have a father. It was a drone. So the answer, drone bees have no fathers, but they do have a grandfather. So thanks for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, wacky animal facts, animals who help humans, or anything about animals in the news, please feel free to send them in to bewilderbeastspod at gmail.com. You can tweet at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, and bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Fun Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from BMC Infectious Diseases, part of Springer Nature, the CDC, Slate.com, ScienceNewsForStudents.org, the FDA, NationalGeographic.com, Baltimore Sun, The Washington Post, Newsweek.com, ScienceAlert.com, and EgoWatch.com. As always, links are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with all of your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Thanks for listening. <laughs>